to the Giles Files, and my name is Nancy Giles. George Camacho, how are you? You look so cute. Oh, thank you. You do too. I got your little thing going here. Yeah. You have on your robe. Is that I your... do. The Franciscan have it. You can see uh -huh. I have a, a cord you. with the three oh, knots. Oh, the cord. Yeah. yeah. Wow. yeah. What do the three knots stand for? Um, so the three knots stand for the three vows that we take. Uh, so they are, include poverty, chastity, and obedience. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. so Franciscan. Yeah. That's pretty yeah. deep. I'm glad yeah. you asked that, Nance, because this will be audio and people won't see your outfit. Yeah. Except I'm going to get right. pictures of you in your... Is it called a habit or is it It called... is called a habit. It, it is, is a called habit. A habit. But okay. some people say robes and mm -hmm. other things, but I guess the official yeah. term would be habit. I see a hood or something on. Do yes. you have jeans underneath that, or I, I am. We're, I'm wearing sweats. I'm wearing okay. sweats today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I do oh, have uh, oh, the oh, full... look at the hood. Yeah. A hoodie. So, <laughs> a friar so it's hoodie. A, the official. But, yes, friar. Yes. Slash capuche. <laughs> really, I think it's it's it used to have a more practical purpose <laughs> um, to protect from the elements, but um, mm -hmm. now it's more. Very rarely will we. I'll pull it up sometimes when mm -hmm, if it's yeah. raining or something like yeah, if that. If you're cold, or, you don't want to get wet. If it's cold, yeah. And but, um, do you wear Wear sandals? I do generally wear sandals. However, if it's the winter, especially here in Albany, and there's snow, boots or shoes. Really? Yeah, but, oh, good. But I do. Because there's an order around here, and I see them in the winter. They still have on sandals. So some orders, the Franciscans have a ton of, of branches and varieties, and there are some groups that when it comes to asceticism and wardrobe, they're very, very strict. I don't have the stamina for it. And thankfully we're not forced to. Yeah. And I have rocked the socks with the sandals. I'm not ashamed. You know, I've, I've done it. You shouldn't be. I, I tried to explain to somebody, I once fell for a guy who was wearing red socks and sandals. It, oh, it, Nancy. I, I can't explain it. I can't explain it. It doesn't take much to get her attention. Okay. <laughs> That's not necessary, but we'll I was press just on. Teasing, just teasing. <laughs> If you've never met a friar, you might want to hit pause and check out Brother George Camacho rocking his Franciscan habit on our official Instagram page, The Giles Files Pod, one word. Brother George is one of the coolest, kindest, and soulful people I know. Producer Nancy Wyatt kicked off our conversation with... So the, the official greeting is... Pax et bonum. Pax et bonum, which is translates right? to peace and peace. good, peace and all good. Yes. And that's a greeting or is that also a goodbye? It can be both. Mm -hmm. And uh, it comes from you know, St. Francis of Assisi. None of us know exactly what he said, but apparently one of his expressions that was pretty common and pretty credible when he would address others was that peace and all good. And he always wanted his friars to extend that message whenever we greeted people and even when we say goodbye. So, yeah. yeah. St. Francis of Assisi, he was the saint of... Well, he has, he's the patron saint of a couple of things. Yeah. What he's most known for these days is uh, ecology. Okay. Creation, um, but certainly associated very much with poverty as well and, and advocating for the poor and marginalized. He's not the only one, of course. No. There's many saints, but yeah, ecology and care for creation is a big one um, that, he's known of, that he's known for. Connected to ecology and creation is isn't St. Francis of Assisi the one that uh, the one if people want to bless their animals, is that through him? As yes, well? yes. Yeah. So on the feast day, uh, which is October 4th, um, it's a popular custom in, in many parishes um, that we're going to bless the animals so people can bring their pets. And it's cute. It's funny mm -hmm. because every year around that time when that blessing happens, I hear about it on the radio, I hear about it on TV and I even see long lines of people yeah. and their animals people you know, like it yeah more well, longer lines than i think sometimes for a regular church service which is interesting it's true well, we love our pets in the u.s so <laughs> yeah. so george okay let's yeah. let's just start like with how we met because i met you when you were a producer at lifetime a producer and a writer mm -hmm. and um i was saying to nancy you were one of my favorites you were a very funny you always had a beautiful smile. We used to go through those sessions fast. You never made me have to say things over and over and over again. There was one particular turning point where you were giving me a, a line reading and you told, you described what you wanted. Will you please uh, bring us back to that very funny moment? So, so let's say we both remember this experience the okay. same way. Okay. But one, thank you again 
for your, your gracious assessment of me. And I'm happy to share what well, my impressions of you were shortly, which were all good as well. But um, so we were in a voiceover session with Nancy and um, I echoed a, uh, a metaphor that I heard from a colleague used with another uh, voiceover actress where she, we were, we had been working through the session, done a long script and the producer says to the talent, okay, uh, you've been ridden hard and now you're put away wet. <laughs> And when I heard this, I said, oh, my gosh, I cannot believe she just said that. You know, it was a female, not that it matters, it was a female producer to a female talent. And the talent was fine. Oh, OK, you know, I get it. And, and I got the gist of it was we've worked hard. I know you're tired. Let's just bring it home with this last sentiment. But of course, my mind immediately went to the gutter. And I was thinking the most graphic and vulgar image. And I said, <laughs> I can't believe it. But I was new. What did I know? Um, so I tell Nancy this story when we meet. I said, Nancy, you'll never guess what I heard a colleague say. <laughs> and Nancy thought it was hysterical. She's like, what? I've never heard that. I said, Nancy, is, is this a thing? I swear to God, I had the same gutter idea as George. Like, what are we saying? So, so we. It was it so was... innocent and so mundane. So that's what we thought. It made us laugh so hard. It made us laugh, and we'd often refer to it. And just it was one of our things that that over the years we'd refer back to every once in a while. Interestingly enough, I retold this story to Jeffrey Harrop, who's a fan of Nancy's and who's a friend of mine from a running group in, in Washington, D.C., where I used to live. And he says, George, um, that's actually an expression that's used in some parts of the South. I can see why you thought that, but it actually means something else. <laughs> so, Jeffrey, please enlighten me. And he said that basically it, it, it's, it can be taken pretty literally in that when you have horses and you ride them, it's good form and it's good care for them to brush them after, after you remove the saddle before you put them in the stable because they're wet, they're sweaty, and it's just not healthy for them to be in that shape uh, to put them in. So this is actually, it's used as an expression, but it actually has a very literal, innocent <laughs> meaning. <laughs> so, <laughs> I learned, who knew? <laughs> <laughs> now our, our whole like filthy, filthy expression no. that connected us turns out to be absolutely <laughs> apt and innocent. How does this transition come to be from a television producer to a monk or a friar? Uh, a sure, friar, yeah. I should Thank say. you. Yeah, no, that's fine. And, and I can quickly explain the distinction for your listeners. So monk uh, typically refers to uh, religious, often in the Catholic church, uh, but there's other kinds of monks, of course, Buddhist monks and other faith traditions. But in our case, it means somebody who's generally cloistered. So it means they live in a convent with a community, um, but they don't leave, you know, except for certain exceptions. Their life is focused on prayer and contemplation. In my case, as a friar, there's some parts of my life that resonate with how monks live, the focus on prayer and contemplation, but we're also in the marketplace. We're expected to be out there engaging people in our ministry or other service work we do. So, but yeah, so no, no worries with that. So fry, friars are our term. And if you, it's funny, sometimes you'll mention it to people who aren't as familiar and very logically, they'll spell it F-R-Y-E-R. <laughs> 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 which, which makes it kind of fun. Um, so in terms of my, my vocation story um, and what, what led to that transition uh, from working in TV and with wonderful people like Nancy to this new uh, sort of call, it wasn't a bolt of lightning. Um, it was very subtle steps over the course of several years that sort of led me on this path. And the way I can recap it briefly um, is that my family, uh, we're from Latin America originally, my parents are from Colombia, mm -hmm. so, so the Catholic faith tradition was always very strong in our house. With that said, I was never being groomed or encouraged to focus on priesthood or religious life or any of that. Um, but, you know, it was something that as an adult, as a young adult, young professional, I kind of started contemplating, but it generally, it basically came from what I can summarize as a dissatisfaction with the current state of my life. Um, nothing bad. I was working successful in New York, nice family. Um, so on the surface, I was like, wow, what do you have to complain about? This is fabulous. You got out of college and you, your first job was a major cable network and that led to work in other places. I was always treated very well, um, despite TV people working very hard, but, <laughs> but um, it was, it, you know, I, I was treated well. I can never complain about who I reported to, who my colleagues were, but I wasn't happy. And, you know, I had many peers who were in this kind of situation. You go to New York, you're, you're following your dreams, you know, whether it's a certain job or an activity or things like that. Why is that I'm miserable by comparison. Mm. 
And as I thought about it more and other experiences happened, I just said, you know, as, as good as everything is on the surface level, I think I feel a calling to live a little differently. And it wasn't as simple as get a new job or you know, move out of my parents' basement. These were certainly options that were on the table. I could have done it, but it felt like it had to be something more dramatic. And I wasn't sure what or what, what or how that was going to happen. But as I started praying on this and taking my faith life a little bit more seriously and talking to people, folks and mentors who, who I thought would be good resources, I thought, you know, I have read a little bit about this man, St. Francis of Assisi. You know, he was a, a party guy in the medieval period, um, had a great life, but kind of wanted to live a little differently and spawned a movement that no one ever expected. I said, there's something about him that I want to I wanna delve into a little bit. And that's how it started. So the first step was meeting uh, the vocation director, who was the equivalent of a recruiter, like in the military or in mm -hmm. HR. And I said, look, I'm, I'm intrigued learning more about what you guys do. Um, I don't know a lot about community life and these things. And I, I'm not saying I want to join. And I always made that very clear. I am <laughs> not saying I want to join. <laughs> I'm just curious to find out more. And that's how it started. So I talked to him for the course of a year. And then at the end of that year, he says, this is Father Brian. He says, all right, I have some options for you, George. Um, one way to help figure this out is if you just volunteer with us. You know, we do a lot of service uh, here in New York and you just get to know us and see that part of our life. No one needs to know that you're discerning a vocation. You can still work and, and do that. It might help you. Or we have a postulancy program that's part of our formation. So the formation experience is sort of like an engagement where you get to try out the life before making the final commitment. And that first year in particular is minimal commitment. You live with the friars and community. There's a program that's structured to help you learn more about it, prayer, service, ministry, and just the general routine of what is it like to be a friar without making that full commitment. Um, and that's how it started. So that's how it's always the theme with me, and I still get made fun of for this by my friar cohort, is it was always very cautious one day at a time. I, I yeah. was never all in. Now, mm -hmm. My, no one knew I was looking into this up no until one, that no, point. Your family, no one, your friends, nobody no, knew. No so one, up to this I, point, it's a secret. It was my secret. It was my secret. But then I, I outed myself at this point <laughs> because, you know, I, I was going to, my living situation was going to change. I had to leave work. And so this is another layer to the story where my family, let's just say they were not happy. They were not really? happy. They were very worried. And, and their, the, the idea of it was if this was somebody else's son, it would have been fabulous. That's great. Oh my goodness. And the church and, and, and dedicating your life. In my case, it's like, oh no, 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 no. <laughs> this is, uh, what are you running away from? And, and it all came from a place of concern and, and care. Like, George, you don't know what these people are like. They're going to lock you up. You know, who knows what they're going to make you do? <laughs> Holy <laughs> back <laughs> roll. <laughs> Now, this was coming from somewhere in that my parents' generation growing up in Colombia, unfortunately, religious life had some elements of this where it was a very rigid and structured life. You were pulled away from your family. You might be able to see them once a year, maybe. It was very different. Wow. Um, and the way I tried to reassure them and myself, I said, look, that's obviously not something I want. If I see for myself that that's the case, you know, I'll pack my little suitcase, say thank you very much and move <laughs> on. <laughs> that doesn't intrigue me at all. But this process just didn't lend itself to that. It felt very different. Um, my frame of reference to any kind of religious life like this is the nun story. And I think yes. about Audrey Hepburn. They lock, I mean, you're like locked in. In those cases, you don't see your family. You give up everything. You sign away yeah. your, you know. So this, this kind of approach makes sense for somebody like you. Some of the responses I was getting about George, you sound like one of those people who's, and I knew it. Sometimes I felt like I sounded like one of those people who was entering a cult and was telling everybody, you guys, this is fine. You don't understand. And sometimes I would second guess myself, like, wait a minute, maybe they're right. And I just don't see what they're seeing. And I said, no, I'm smarter than this. <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm not struggling that way. You mentioned something a little bit earlier. People thought you might be running away from something. And I'm just wondering, do you feel like you were running away or running toward uh, life, a different kind of life, leaving or entering or where does it sit with you? Sure. Well, I think it was a little bit of both. The way that I would frame it is more so running towards, right? So I wasn't 
trying to escape anything. I was trying to escape the, this sort of monotony. Um, uh, yeah, this rut, for lack of a better word. So I mean, never dismissing the great opportunities I had at my disposal and, and working with these incredible people in a creative environment. And, and I miss, I do miss that. Not the work, the people. The people were, it was a fun environment. Um, but I wanted something more. And I wasn't sure what that more was, but I knew that it didn't involve working 60 hour weeks um, and trying to fit in service or volunteering or my faith life when I wasn't too busy working. And I was having a really tough time striking that balance and the relationships. So, I mean, obviously I don't live in a way that, that allots for a romantic or committed relationship in that way, uh, one-on-one, but uh, I've now since becoming a friar, both with my friar cohort and the people I engage, um, the relationships are more, uh, more interesting and uh, deeper than what I was able to manage on my own. So um, yeah, I was definitely saw myself as running towards something. Now you say yes to one thing, it means saying no to something else. And, mm-hmm. and that's, you know, there's no, there's no gray area there, but right. it seems to make sense for me. And the longer I'm a part of it, the more I say, all right, this fits. You chose to be to go out into the world and be among the people as opposed to a cloistered life. Mm-hmm. What determined that choice? Uh, sure. Well, um, I wasn't entirely conscious. I knew that I didn't know a lot about religious life. You know, as a Catholic child, you hear, you know, nuns, you know what they look like, either through movies like The Nun Story or we, we engage them in different settings. Um, the same thing with priests. All I knew was that I was familiar slightly with the St. Francis and this group in Manhattan that seemed to not be cloistered. They went out, they, they did other things, they, you know, they worked with people, and that intrigued me. I said, I don't want to, even seeing them do that in the setting of New York City, I said, this, is, this, this feels like it could be me. I don't want to leave you know, the hustle and bustle and, and, and go into a, sometimes it'd be nice you know, to disappear for a bit and have that, but as a general life change, that would have been too extreme and not right for me. So right. I, as I got to know this group in particular, I just happened to land upon a group that seemed to that I seemed to fit in with mm-hmm. when it came to that. So I lucked out. And maybe yeah. if they had been more cloistered, I would have said this isn't for me or, you know, who knows? But yeah, it wasn't a conscious decision entirely, but it felt like the right move with this uh, group. Because I know you and because I know uh, even with doing mundane promos for lifetime you brought a lot of joy into the room and i would think that would be something that would really be helpful to people and thank you nancy and i just i I know i don't want to shift the conversation but i want to say that one of the best memories of working with you was just we would laugh a lot (laughs) we would just laugh and it was we had to do our work and then get it done but we would laugh a lot this was key we would do the work really fast you know you weren't one of those give me six, six times, three times in a row. We do it three times, you go, great, you know? And then we would just put our feet up and laugh. And that, (laughs) yeah. Um, So I'm so glad that you are working with people. It feels right. George, Um, can I ask you, when you were making these considerations and thinking about doing um, the Friar tryout, that's what I'm going to call it. Mm -hmm. um, Was, did you think about like therapy or anything like that? Was that an option or, you know, as you were contemplating not, really feeling happy in your life? Sure. No, it's a very good question. So leading up to this, not that last year specifically, but a couple of years prior, I did see a life coach, not a, not a therapist, not okay. a psychologist, but just somebody that um, I met at a workshop uh, for gay men and stress and just kind of an interesting, unique uh, insight that he brought and I said, this sounds kind of interesting. I'm a gay man and I'm stressed. So let me check out this workshop that's <laughs> custom made for me. <laughs> so it ended up turning into a one-on-one uh, relationship over the course of a year and a half where we would meet regularly and discuss all sorts of things. Mm-hmm. Uh, just the direction my life was taking, work, nutrition, um, romantic uh, life coming out. Um, so that was the, ext- the vocation, religious vocation wasn't on the horizon at that okay. point, but talking with him helped me sort of hone in on, I want to live differently. Um, I didn't go the extent of a formal therapy relationship. However, mm-hmm. as a friar, that's become very important. Um, and thankfully, um, my province has been very good about supporting that resource. How did your sexuality come into play in terms of, um, becoming a friar. Sure. Um, So one of my, one thing that I was very upfront about, 
um, with my vocation director. It was my first uh, friar contact. I said, look, one thing I'd like to put on the table right now is that I am a gay man. Um, I understand the vows, you know, that there's, I mean, I don't understand them entirely, but I get the chastity is what it is. You're not going to live a, a sexual or physically sexual life. Um, if that's going to be an issue, I'd rather settle it now. And, you know, if I don't want to waste either of our time, because I didn't know, but I said, the one thing I do know is that I'm not going to be, I'm not going to hide this because, or try, because then I'll be miserable. That, that just would defeat the purpose of this journey towards authenticity. So he was very good in his response and honest. He said, look, what I can tell you is that the friars who are part of it in this province, uh, we've all had all sorts of relationships before coming in. Um, I, I can pretty much promise you that's not going to be an issue or you'll experience any backlash in this group. Mm -hmm. um, so I you know, thank you for letting me know. And uh, you know, we'll, we'll address that as it goes and, and see how you feel. And so, and he was right. Knowing that part of your vows were chastity, was that hard to reconcile? Was it like, oh man, sure, never, well, you know. Chastity was not a big selling point. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be completely honest. I mean, yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, a part of me uh, was, I said, you know, maybe I'm doing this too soon because of that. Maybe it'd be nice to, to date more and to explore relationships before saying no to it uh, mm -hmm. in a life that, uh in a life that where the, the conditions are pretty specific in terms of what you can and can't do. Um, but again, I thought, okay, if it ends up being too much for me and I realize that um, having to, to live that way is just not the right fit, then I'll leave and move on. It doesn't mean that the challenge isn't there, that it's not something I think about of what could have been. And I'm still meeting people, not as potential uh, romantic partners, but you know, every once in a while, oh, if I met this guy, <laughs> if I met this guy 10 years ago, oh. He's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> That is so cute. And luckily having resources, including a therapist and a spiritual director, which is another support system that I have that I'm happy to talk about more if, if you'd like to know. And, and even my, I'm not the only one in this. I live in part of a community where we're all living this way. And it, it helps that we're all after something. We're not the same personality. We didn't choose to live together necessarily, but we're all after living the gospel and living with greater integrity and, and making these concessions that help us do that. So it's nice to not be in it alone it, it makes it more palpable and and more life-giving because if I were you know constantly frustrated and miserable about everything I'm not allowed to do I wouldn't be a very good friar or a person to live with or you know. very happy as a person or, yeah. Exactly. yeah yeah I think that combination of, of of spirituality and the fact that therapy is a regular part of what goes on and what's the other thing you said a spiritual a spiritual director so yeah I can I can just explain a little bit yeah. of what that is so a spiritual direction is not something that's only for religious people and and uh in, in the in a religious order um it's not only catholics who have this other christian groups and i'm sure other faith traditions as well but basically it's more like a spiritual companion you meet with someone who may be a religious may be a priest may be a lay person and you talk about how God is working in your life, maybe meeting on a monthly basis, um, praying together, no longer than an hour, usually. Um, and, and that's what it is, just someone to walk with and kind of explore, okay, how is God working through this crisis? Or how is God working through this celebration? Or, um, and it's nice to have feedback and somebody kind of praying with you, even in between times, in between sessions, to know that somebody's walking with you. That's been a very, uh, it's something I didn't know about before becoming a friar, but I've really valued the experience because it's another support. It's another way to, 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 to reflect on how we're living and, and try to do it well. I mean, one of the things that you are describing that's really impressing me about this, because I'm not I consider myself spiritual, but not really religious, is you have a very gentle approach to this that's not hardcore. If you do this, this will happen. Right. You know, I think that's one of the things about faith or religion that's always made me very wary. Sure. But I, I'm listening and I'm loving it. And this is great. And this is great. And then at one part in, during the service, it's and because we are the chosen people that and then I'm like, wait a minute, what? what that doesn't ring right with my right. ear so my <laughs> issue is is this we're the best stuff which just drives we me can crazy. be a little we can be a little arrogant we can be a little arrogant <laughs> <laughs> what can be done think, about that george that's almost every almost every religion thinks they're the chosen one. Oh, well, sure. that's, I, and, I, and, 
no, go ahead. It's sorry. so much to legitimize whatever, you know, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Um, no, no, and I was bringing it to you because what I like about what you're saying about this, and this is a, this is, you know, you're a Catholic friar, but you're describing this faith in very gentle ways that don't seem harsh and they don't seem like we're better than everybody else, which is new to my ear. You know, one thing we religious folks always have to keep in mind is that, of course, to some extent, we think we've got it. We have the understanding of God that, you know, all those other poor souls, like, sorry, I don't know what to tell you. But the reality is <laughs> <laughs> this entity that we call God is people of faith. It's, it's way too complicated and it can't be limited to one faith tradition. It can't be limited to one mode of thought because God is bigger than all that. How can any one faith tradition claim it? Um, I, I am happy to know there's other people of faith out there, but by no means, um, you know, if someone just doesn't faith traditions is not traditional faith traditions is not what they're about. It doesn't mean that the values don't overlap and that we can't connect in that way. At some point, humanity, you know, we, that touches each other. That's right. what we do. We're human beings that are our core. And I think we're good human beings at our core. We just learn some things that kind of divert us from the path. Um, but no, absolutely. Yeah, no, no faith tradition can claim absolute truth. Now, granted, not all your listeners may agree with that. And even some of the friars I live with may not agree. With. <laughs> but I, I do think that the complexity of God and, and that reality is, is way beyond anything we can fathom as human beings. Can we rewind and go back to what it was like for you, like the first day you've, you've, I guess, sold your possessions or whatnot, said goodbye to your family and what, and now you're in like Friar School 101. Did you have to sell your possessions? <laughs> um, the first year I did not have to divest anything. So oh, that's the first good. Year, yeah, the first year was just, we're trying it out. Oh, that's right. That's yeah. right. Okay. As, as I got more involved and there was, yeah, some, some concessions I had to make with that. But, but in the beginning, no, they don't immediately say, all right, you're in or you're out. You know? Worldly goods gone. Yeah, no. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, luckily, and they're it's a pragmatic group. And, oh, good. I know, and, right? Which right. is which is nice. Um, so as far as I'm in, you know, once uh, you know, some tough goodbyes, and this is Boston. Boston was where the program took place in, okay. in downtown Boston initially at St. Anthony Shrine. Um, okay, I'm I was, sorry. Oh, quick goodbyes. Uh, is that so now you're you're cut off for okay, a while? So I'll, I'll explain what that okay, is. So, sorry. yeah, basically, my family and I drove up together to Boston. Mm -hmm. I felt it was good for them to see. I think it actually just made it worse. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the intention was good. <laughs> that Your heart was in the right place, George. Yeah, yeah, I want so, to include them. And then right. I'm sorry I included them. <laughs> OK, so what? So, so tell us. So basically, um, the idea is that I would not be cloistered doesn't mean locked in the house in Boston and never leave, but I was moving there. I was moving there for a year. It wasn't just a, a long weekend or, you know, uh, so it was a permanent move, but not, not that I couldn't use the phone or, you know, visit on weekends occasionally or things like that. So yeah, that's, that's, it was a shift as if I was moving out of my parents' house, but with a special nuance that I wasn't just getting a new apartment. I was in this program that was structured to see if one, if I wanted to be a friar and two, if the friars wanted me to be a friar. So it's a mutual, it's a right. mutual evaluation. Cool. They could have tell me to leave at any point. Too. <laughs> oh my God, this is real. <laughs> wow wow my, my formation directors at the time uh so these were the the friars that were leading us me and two other friar tryouts postulants through this experience they were the kindest men i think you know you'll ever meet just very uh very open um very transparent, uh, very honest and, and supportive. So I mean, it was, that really put me at ease because this was my first, they were the first line. My first point of reference was them and by extension, the rest of the community in that house in, in St. Anthony Shrine. So that helped calm my nerves. It was a gentle initiation. We didn't actually engage in any formal classes or, or rituals. Um, we went to the mass and pray together, of course, but anything more structured formation, we were eased into it. The first month was basically acclimate to this house, um, acclimate to the city, you know, register for a philosophy class at a local college. Um, just so it was very gentle initiation, um, which was nice. So that, mm -hmm. that really helped calm my nerves. I was very nervous. I said, very nervous. So it was a good fit because I think for, for me anyway, that year, I got to see a variety 
of friar roles. You know, those who were more internal, they were older and retired. So they focused on masses and confession and giving the sacraments. Those who were younger and going to school or, you know, they had outside ministries at other places, but we would all come together at night for prayer and dinner and things like that. So it was a good place to see a lot without having to leave, <laughs> without yeah. having to leave home, so to speak. <laughs> Um, nowadays, there aren't that many friars like that, friaries like that. There aren't as many friars, period. So there's very few where you'll have that many people living in one place. But um, that house uh, had that advantage. So. Oh, that sounds lovely. Yeah. So you get there, they give you mm -hmm. a room, you have a room to yourself. Yes, thankfully. Uh, I had my own room, uh, shared bathrooms, so but that's fine. We did it mm -hmm. in college, so <laughs> yeah. no, no big deal. And uh, yeah, the living situation was we had our own rooms. Um, not uh, We were in mixed population with the other friars who were mm -hmm. professed. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, the, the house was, uh, I guess it had about eight floors. It was a big, big friary. So in my case, the final vows were uh, 2016. The final. Oh, final vows or song. Your profession. final vows. Was that mm -hmm. a big ceremony? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. um, so sol final vows, or as we formally call it, solemn profession. That's it. That's the wedding, so to speak. Wow. So, uh, what, what do you wear? <laughs> you're looking at it. Really? Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. is, that so, the, is that the first time you wear that or are you um, wearing that as soon as you go in, you know, so, as soon as you went in? Sure. No, good question. The habit, we received that during the novitiate year. So the novitiate year is the second year of formation. As far as wardrobe, we wear the same thing. It's a special mass. So the provincial who, he's the friar that's, the head of the province. Um, he presides at the ceremony along with, with other friars. And, um, you know, it's a beautiful ceremony. It's, you, know, you get a blessing and then your families are there and friends. It's an open ceremony. Mine was in New York in the same church where I first met them in 31st Street. Um, and it was, it, was, it was a beautiful experience. My parents were there, you know, uh, they brought up the, so we have the host and the, the wine. Mm -hmm. um, they brought up the wine to the altar and I said, oh my God, I can't believe my mother's doing this. And um, so it was, it was just nice. It, it came together in a way where my family too, I don't think we'll ever fully understand why or, or how I did this, but they see I'm in a good place. Oh, that's uh, wonderful. Yes. I was picturing, wondering if your mother and father were sobbing uncontrollably or <laughs> Am I, they, a little bit. Yeah. So was I not, not during the ceremony. I waited till after. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really a friar. Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> that transition from being George Camacho George to mm -hmm. the brother that you wore, like, you yeah. know, what was that with the clothes? I mean, how, how did that work? How'd that be? Well, uh, it felt so awkward. I mean, I, you know, I could yeah. say this about so many milestones during this experience. And I'll, I have a funny story that will illustrate this. I'll keep it brief. Um, the first experience I had wearing the habit was the ordination for a deacon. So it was the first time I was getting together with friars I didn't live with okay. wearing the habit in Chicago. And I walked into the lobby before the ceremony was starting. And I said, oh, my God, look at these men. They're all wearing this brown thing. And I forgot I was wearing it, too. <laughs> I said, I'm describing these poor guys like these weirdos. Like, no, I'm one of you now. <laughs> So it was a little, a little surreal. Um, it took a while to get adjusted. Also, you know, I didn't, I never wore skirts before this. Um, so I wasn't used to the nuances of walking up and down the stairs. I tripped a couple of times. I just didn't realize you had to do that. Right. Long skirts. Yeah. Long skirts. Yeah. Long skirts. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when you're walking down the street, does, do people say things to you or ask you weird questions or? Yeah, it's interesting. So wearing the habit in public is it's an open door. Uh, mm -hmm. It's an invitation. It may be a good invitation or a bad one, depending on who you get. It runs the gamut. You know, uh, generally, thankfully, most reactions are positive. You know, there's some people who are genuinely intrigued, especially in Manhattan. It was interesting. I remember one uh, nice lady, she walked up to me once. I was somewhere, 6th Avenue and 23rd Street or the Chelsea area, which... Mm -hmm. Um, and she's, you know, it's really encouraging to see you guys here in the midst of New York City, you know, that you're a presence here. I said, oh, it was so nice. You know, I don't know if she was Catholic. I don't, you know, we didn't get into that, but I thought it was very, you know, it was a very encouraging response. Mm -hmm. um, children will sometimes think you're a ninja. You oh know, they make goodness. connections. 
or a Jedi. If the、oh、kids who like Star Wars, you know, we look like Obi Wan a little bit.、Uh, so that's cute. It opens up a conversation too. If it's a child, I know I'm probably never going to see again. I tell them, yes, I am. My lifesaver is at home. <laughs> <laughs> so sweet. But, yeah. If If the parents want to engage in a larger discussion, you know, I'll, I'll explain a little more.、Uh, sometimes the reactions are negative.、Uh, so, you know, the church, unfortunately, we've hurt some people over the years, and、um, whether or not I'm directly responsible, I become an opportunity for someone to say, "Hey, you did X, Y, and Z, or what are you guys about?" Or、nice. um, even the something concrete, the LGBT community. Sometimes it can work both ways. One, folks who are, you know.、Uh, Anti-LGBT or have some homophobia, and they're like, "People, our church is against this. What are you doing?" Or the other extreme, where it's、uh, folks who've been hurt by the church, LGBTQ folks have been hurt. Say, "Wait a minute, you, what are you people? You're not what you say you are." And so I've had、right. I've had the gamut,、sure. and、uh, you know, it's it's what it's about. Now I'll be honest. Sometimes when traveling, and I don't always wear it. If I go to a movie or if I'm on an airplane, I, I we have the freedom. In my、oh. province to do that, so sometimes I'm a little selfish,、um, and I because I I know that if I wear it, I need to be on. I can't tell people, yeah, you don't have time for this conversation. <laughs> 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 <You know? laughs> so look, I'm running late. Okay, exactly, yeah, exactly.、Oh, you have to、wow. be mindful of that. I try. I've gotten more comfortable wearing it in more settings and more places over the years. At the college, I wear it all the time. Yeah, you know, for branding purposes, when you dress like me. It's it serves a practical purpose of marketing. Not that that's what we're about at our core. <laughs> Jeez, I never would have put the the phrase "fryer" and marketing or branding together.、Mm, interesting, but it、George. is it is what we think about.、It. And another interesting anecdote: you can't see it. Well, your your listeners can't see it at all. But、um, in our in our Zoom here,、um, the fryer habit. If, if I were to stand up and hold my arms out, it kind of it looks like the shape of a cross. And Francis of Assisi was very intentional with that. He wanted us to. He wanted that. You know, there's something that even in what we wear sends a message that we we represent something larger than us. In this case, the gospel. You,、um, so yeah, that's that's. You have、it. the wooden cross. The towel. Yes, I'm not、the、wearing、towel? it right now, but、uh-huh. I do have it. The towel cross. So again, it was a symbol that、um, Francis.、Um, it's a letter from the Greek alphabet,、um, but、um, he he liked. Part of the reason he appreciated it so much was that it looked like a cross. It was in the shape of a cross, so he'd often use it. He imprinted in caves where he visited.、Mm-hmm. Um, he encouraged the friars, you know, live the towel, be in this form, just not just physically wearing your habit, but but live what it represents. So,、mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So,、mm-hmm. George, now you're at Siena College, and you're the director of the Damietta Cross Cultural Center. Correct. So,、mm-hmm. what is that? What What's your workday like? What do you do? <laughs> So、uh, it is, in some ways, nine to five. You know, I'm back in that model, <laughs> so to speak.、Um, but primarily, the, the the focus of the office here at the college is to empower, to celebrate diversity, and to empower our students who come from a predominantly marginalized populations. So this includes our students of color. Our students who identify as LGBTQ plus, and our students who are of non-Catholic faith traditions. So it's a predominantly small school,、uh, 3,000 students, but predominantly white cisgender. So our students who don't fit into those categories, unfortunately, have a tougher time fitting in.、Um, so my office, we try to support them, and、uh, through programming, through having a space. Where they can come together and just you know feel supported and engage mutually,、um, that that's what we do. So I, I organize programs. I, I invite like dance. Pre- no, I, I always refer to dance presentations. Dance. Some which <laughs> include dance. You love dance, <laughs> admit it.、Yeah. Uh, speakers,、um, different workshops. We do trainings that the students run. That we teach them how to run and facilitate to promote inclusivity on campus. Going to the classroom, we have multicultural talent shows.、Um, And and really just try to educate. It's not we don't only serve、uh, these groups. We try to work with the large community to to bring allies and to show them, hey, these are your peers. It's great. You know, not only do we not want to hurt them, we want to build bridges and get to know each other. And what a great thing! So that's that's what I do. So it's fun. It, it can be a lot. It can suck you. And I never realized, Nancy, that, that higher education people there's as much drama and as much stress as there could be in entertainment. I,、oh, I didn't know. My God! <laughs> oh, are you kidding? I, I, oh my God! The stories I can tell you. <laughs> Well, 
That's our show. Thanks to our dear friend, the soulful Brother George Camacho. We loved our conversation and hope you were inspired by George as much as we were. Pax et bonum. Peace and goodness be with you. The Giles Files was created by Nancy Giles and Nancy Wyatt, masterfully produced, directed, and edited by Nancy Wyatt, and recorded at our studios in Weehawken, New Jersey. Be sure to check out The Giles Files on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And hey, write us a review. Tell us what you think. We want to hear from you. We'll be back soon with a new season of The Giles Files. In the meantime, if you missed any of our episodes, go back and take a listen. They're all buffo. Oops. <laughs> a Huda Media Production.